I started off as a musician, became a recording engineer. I was a radio announcer slash DJ for two years. I was MC for parties, band leader, recording engineer, still do voiceovers. I'm 45 years old and I haven't found what I want to do as an adult yet. Even now, people say that being a musician is not a real career. You know, I don't miss the politics of being a musician and being in a band. Being in a band is like being married to five guys. <laughs> like having successful productions like Outer Banks, HBO, Succession, those sort of things are a great CV builder for the country. What do you would tell to a person who wants to start, who wants to make that transition, but don't have everything to start with? Just start, yeah. The simple. Just, just start. Just start. A lot of times it's just your own self-doubt and right. your own uh, self-limiting beliefs that stop you from doing something. How do you actually tell the difference between when you're supposed to be pushing yourself and when you're supposed to rest and reset? I, I had a very difficult experience with a home invasion, um, but we got chopped up. That was a very difficult time in my life. But I went straight to Mojo and I, that was it. We don't get chopped up. Give me some drinks. Do you think you are healed? Healing, again, is not a straight line. You kind of just got to put your head down and, and push through. You got to be tenacious and be able to, to find a way or a path through. You know, that I, I, I've been so effects. <laughs> Welcome to Gems from Friends. This is where we have conversations with creators, entrepreneurs, young professionals, collecting stories of brands and people. Hopefully we can motivate and inspire and maybe even ignite the fire for others to start their own projects. I hope you enjoy this episode. Stay tuned. All right, so Phil, what are you going to do? I'm going to just start with, with introducing you. I usually say the person in front of me. And then I'll let you come in from there. Uh, you won't go by any other titles other than producer? No. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Got enough others, but... Go, yeah. Tell me some of the others. Though. Um, well, Fixer is one of them, mm -hmm. for sure. Drone operator. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use pilot because my brother's a pilot. And that's, <laughs> that's create issues when I, when I, I say I'm a pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, drone operator. Uh, but I've worn many hats. Over the years, as you know, mm -hmm, yeah. but um, yeah, producer is a good one. Okay, cool. Well, you just did it. You just did your intro. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get right in and ask you, what is a fixer? Because like, if you're not on film set and you hear the term fixer, that sounds like somebody is called over to your house. Mafia. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have to put that caveat in pretty much every time I uh, introduce myself as a fixer. Mm -hmm. So a fixer is basically a person that handles a lot of the pre-production for a, a TV series or a, a movie. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's when uh, a production is going into a different country than it's used to producing in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not familiar with the uh, ways of doing things and the people and the connections that they need to have. It's uh, heavily logistics based. Right. So it involves a lot of planning, uh, a lot of negotiations. So um, a fixer can be also a location scout. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of different roles within that remit. And right. so, and it varies from production to production. So they have different expectations. So location scouting, interfacing with government mm -hmm. is a big one. Normally securing permits, getting permissions, drone permissions, uh, working with different departments to get, you know, road closures or permission to enter sensitive areas, mm -hmm. things like that. It sort of requires a, a skill where you need to be able to speak with almost anybody from any level, from the highest level of government to, you know, the, the fisherman mm -hmm. on a dock right. kind of thing, which is what, what I was just doing. So <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So how you fell into that role? Like, is it something that you said, or you know what? Let me just wake up the next day and won't be a fixer, or it just happened. No, that before? that's that's a really good term. Actually, fell into it is is <laughs> <laughs> really apt. So I, I guess I could say I was a fixer before I knew what a fixer was. In 2018, I was driving down the road in St. John, and I got a phone call from this guy saying he was looking to film here. So long story short, it ended up being this production for Sky TV and Netflix. And, um, you know, he said he was looking for somebody to help him organize things in Barbados. And he saw my website and, you know, that was 
uh, where we got started. So he sat down and said, you know, he was doing this car based show, kind of like um, Top Gear. Mm -hmm. And um, he was coming down here with a lot of people. He was bringing in a car. He was, you know, needed all sorts of permissions and that sort of thing. And he used the, ter the term fixer. And I, I, just like you said before, I, you know, I didn't know what the term a fixer was at the time. But, uh, you know, it was basically what I just described. It was, you know, organizing everything for the shoot, making sure that everything was in place, negotiating uh, location fees and hiring crew and, right. and all that stuff. And so I had actually been doing that for a little while prior. I just didn't know what the title was. You didn't have a title. Yeah, and I think, right. you know, different locations in different countries have different terms and terminology for uh, production okay. in general. Okay. So, for example, in the UK, a location scout is not something that people are familiar with. That's a US term. Mm -hmm. In the UK, they call it a recce. I think a fixer was was something more that came from the UK or the Europe. Okay. Um, and so I hadn't been really familiar with it. So, yeah. So, basically, I got hired as a fixer for the first time around 2018 or so. But mm -hmm. I've been kind of doing that for a little while on a smaller scale. On that a smaller was, scale. Yeah. But we know in from Barbados that you usually have to take on like multiple roles. It's at true. At the same time. It's true. On the same job. Yep. <laughs> it's very true. One man band. Yeah. And I, and that's exactly what a fixer is. Um, so, you know, that sort of set me up good because, mm -hmm. you know, Barbados is small. The industry is pretty small and you kind of got to take what you can get when you get work. You're so right. that sort of prepared me, you know, being able to fill multiple roles in different um, situations and different types of production sort mm -hmm. of uh, it was almost like a training ground right, right for that sort of thing so okay so yeah so phil you have a couple of awards on your belt you could enlighten me on what those are yeah sure um so prior to getting into television um i was doing a lot of advertising okay so that's basically where i got started in production in general my my background's in audio um i have a degree in recording engineering and um i worked in a commercial recording studio for about three years mm -hmm. and then basically i got laid off because of a big shift in the industry okay um and i started my own studio and i started doing the same type of stuff jingles and voiceovers and that kind of thing as well as music recording my first sort of big award actually i just posted about it on facebook because a memory popped up it was it was a christmas jingle <laughs> for uh, mcdonald's and i got that job through um virgo communications who okay. were a great client of mine i got recommended to another agency in the usba okay and they wanted me to do a jingle for mcdonald's for christmas for a quarter pounder and so i did it you know i sampled some uh, music from elvis presley and used that to create a jingle and it was a a, a white christmas based thing for a cheeseburger quarter pounder my client was involved in the Advertising Federation and um, she submitted it to the Addy Awards and I didn't even know what the Addy Awards were and it won. And not only did it win, but it won Best in Show, which was wow. kind of crazy for a jingle because normally, you know, TV campaigns and yeah. TV commercials win Best in Show. Right. And yeah, that was kind of shocking, to be yeah, honest with you, when, it, crazy. when I heard it. And yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the first one. And so that sort of... You know, started the ball, started the ball rolling in, and obviously, you know, having an award helps get more work and that sort right. of thing. And I kept entering the Audi Awards over the years and won a bunch. I think I've won something like thirteen or fourteen golds and silvers. So this first award was in the same <laughs> year that you opened your own studio. No, I believe it was about seven years after that. Oh, seven years in. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. two thousand and eight. I opened the studio around two thousand and one, two thousand and two. Okay. Yeah. So how was the transition coming from working in someone's studio to having your own? It was wild, man. <laughs> um, I'm sure you can relate because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when I, when I started up, I bought all your necessary equipment and that kind of thing, but I ran out of money. <laughs> and so I had nowhere to, to put furniture. I had, I had, I basically set up my studio on the boxes that the equipment came in. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I had a little desk and a chair, but pretty much my racks were the boxes that 
everything yeah. came in and uh, you know that's where it started so you bought the equipment but you didn't have anything to put it on <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> and so that's kind of where i got started and i would you know get a voiceover and you know add a piece here and a piece there and right, right, had a friend right. build me a console and, and that kind of stuff for the gear you know back then it's so different to know because i feel like no people are under so much pressure on getting started because they yeah. believe that they should have all the furniture Yep. They should have every single thing in place. Yeah. And start at the top in order to open. That's so true, man. And yeah. and I mean because everything has now become so visual, you know, so it has to be Instagrammable. You or gotta keep up appearances. It's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah, man. I mean there wasn't any social media back then. It eh? showed right. my age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh the, the dawn of the new century, literally. Right, right. Uh, I just I had no choice because there weren't really many jobs for my role as a recording engineer okay. um, to be had. People had their own studio and you were a one-man band and people weren't really hiring recording engineers unless uh, you work for a radio station, which is mm -hmm. something I really didn't want to do at the right. time, but I actually ended up doing eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so it was either, you know, find work outside of Barbados or do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do my own thing. So you're first set of clients when you were working on these boxes and not <laughs> on furniture did you had any form of like insecurity oh for sure i mean you know uh, you start off and and first of all three years out of university you start your own business i think i was 21 or 22 years old right there's definitely the sort of imposter syndrome that sort of keeps you from wanting to to put yourself out there mm -hmm. and uh, that's a big thing i mean i still have it no i mean it mm -hmm. still it still manifests itself right but you know i got uh, i was very lucky in that my parents were very encouraging my stepdad and my mom you know they they had always supported me in whatever i wanted to do and whatever i wanted to pursue mm -hmm. um and so they gave me a lot of encouragement and <laughs> having the experience in the commercial uh, recording studio definitely helped mm -hmm. boost my confidence. Right. And, um, you know, I still had a, a lot of contacts in the industry and that kind of thing. And I was an active musician as well, mm -hmm. which was helpful. Right. So, you know, I, I just kind of went for it, but um, definitely bringing a client in. But obviously, you know, these people, I also considered my friends because I knew them socially. Barbados is a small place. Mm -hmm. And I was just straight with them, you know, look, I still ain't got the furniture, but I got yeah, the gear. Yeah. Come in and give it a shot, give you a discount, and right. let's see how it goes. Right. And, um, and you know, I wasn't taking pictures. <laughs> nah, there wasn't, any, there wasn't any Instagram or anything. So. But yeah, it was, I mean, I can't remember how long I had the the box the boxes there with the equipment on it, but it, it was a while. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely did some work with it and got paid. And that's how I ended up building out the studio. Right. I just kind of, I, I didn't care. I, right. I, I had to do it. I had no choice. I think that for me personally, and you could tell me what you think, mm. um, I found that having less um, options kind of helped the creative process a little bit. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, now we have an abundance of things. So now it's almost like you don't know what to choose. And then it kind of paralyzes you yep. from be starting. Yep. I is the term analysis paralysis. Yeah. Paralysis <laughs> by analysis. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. So I I found like any time when you came up, you know, you just use what you had and you start where you started. Pretty much. And yeah. Just go. You kind of had to be resourceful. Um, you know, uh, th there was very limited resources online as well. Like they didn't have all these sound effects packages and right. it had some, but you know, internet was still mm -hmm. relatively new back in the day and right. you know you had to uh, basically create your own sound effects and and be, be as resourceful as possible yeah you know i remember i did a, a intro for um the lottery and it's the, the, the visual is these um balls kind of going through a, a track and uh, i couldn't find a sound effect that fit so i ended up going and getting some marbles and rolling them across <laughs> <laughs> rolling them across the, the counter right. to record it to get that effect and it worked. Wow. But you just like you said, you gotta be resourceful and, and you know, find a way yeah. somehow. Yeah. What do you would tell to a person who wants to start, who wants to make that transition but don't have everything to start with? Just start. 
Yeah. This simple. Just just start. just start. Yeah. And you know, once you have a vision ahead of you, mm-hmm. once you visualize in your mind's eye what you're going for and the direction that you're going, the path that you take almost doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously you have to make the right decisions and you have to be, you know, mindful of who you work with and um, the way you conduct yourself in, in terms of being professional, but that kind of goes without saying yeah, if you want yeah. to be a professional. Yeah, you just got to go for it because I didn't know how to run a business when I was 22. Mm-hmm. I had no clue. Mm-hmm. You know, I just kind of knew I had no choice. And, you know, once you're open to learning and growing and, and actually um, moreover learning from your experiences, mm-hmm. from your mistakes yeah. and adjusting accordingly, then, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, just you just got to start. What are so many uphill battles you had to fight with the transition, being a freelancer to know owning your business? Well, that was one of them, learning how to own and run a business. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, again, luckily, um, my mom was, you know, she had recently retired mm-hmm. and uh, she was HR at a, at a fairly good accounting company. And so she was helpful in teaching me how to do, you know, regular admin and, and that sort of thing, invoicing and that sort of stuff, which was very, very important. I still get invoices from people these days that just say invoice on a file. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I got to rename it, but yeah. those, those, those simple things um, definitely helped. Uh, coming from a background of music, I had no experience in running a business whatsoever. Right. You know, I, I was basically a musician uh, for 15 years um, leading up to to being in that position as a recording engineer and, and owning a studio and, and that kind of thing. And um, it was difficult for sure. It was, you know, scratching my head, trying to figure out, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what to do with, with, you know, filing taxes and all that stuff. Right. It was, it was challenging for sure. So before the award, there were seven years in, mm-hmm. would you say you got comfortable within before that seven years time or? I can't say that I've ever been comfortable. <laughs> yeah. You don't find the comfort, the comfort zone yet. I mean, yeah, there's a comfort yeah. zone, but I, you know, for me, I think personally, I, I get bored easy. Right. You know, I, I am always looking for the next okay. goal or for the next way to um, grow myself and to learn. And, you know, I started off doing voiceovers and, and that's kind of thing and doing that for three years you know, after a little while, it becomes kind of like plug and play. It's like building Legos, you know, how to put yeah, it together. Yeah, yeah. So I just kept, I was really interested in sound design. I loved sound design. And I was actually, in my mind, I was thinking that one path could have been a Foley designer. It would, where, you know, they basically do what I just said. They create sounds out of nothing, using materials, mm-hmm. random materials um, out of nowhere. So I did a couple of sound design um, jobs, which... I really loved, like it's basically, you know, like build, making a cake, you would know how it is. You, you put layers together and mm-hmm. you figure out how that sounds um, and, and mixing the the different elements to create something brand new Yeah, uh, was really, really interesting to me. And so I kind of focused on that a little bit as well as the commercial stuff, as well as the jingles because that paid the bills. Um, and I started doing that for animations, you know, okay. so little independent animations or animation for, um, you know, NGOs and stuff like that. And that led me to an opportunity where I actually got to produce an animation and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the process of creating something out of nothing, um, just something out of your head, which I was familiar with with music, but then the visual dynamic was mm-hmm. something, I'm a very visual person. And that opened a whole new door to me because obviously it was a completely different dynamic in building layers of visual elements as well as sound. Yeah. You know, that, that sort of spurred, I think, my sort of tendency to evolve mm-hmm. professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because after, after doing something for 10 years, you kind of want to expand your horizons. You kind of want right. to find new things and new ways to to develop 
professionally. Well, some people. Some people. That, <laughs> yeah. That's me. I, I yeah, guess yeah. that's me. I, I can't really speak for anybody else. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what um, my path was for sure. What made you transition again, though, from... Because you did a lot of transitions. Um, <laughs> Correct. Because <laughs> so, yeah. you mentioned doing voiceovers, doing jingles, and, yeah. and you're doing a lot of um, stuff. And mm. then you... I mean, we went from all of that to netflix stuff which we can get into mm. soon but before all of that there was music yeah and you were in a band yeah a couple a couple bands yeah, yeah. what is one was one of the bands you think people may know um probably the longest one i was in it was called roadhouse roadhouse okay yeah, yeah, yeah. and what you were what, what was the instrument <clears throat> i played guitar and i was a singer one of okay. the lead singers yeah okay and how many years did that long time um i think probably about 10 15 years okay yeah but before that i was kind of playing um duos in bars and restaurants and just kind of freelance gigging around wherever they would hire me kind of thing gap was kind of my stomping ground st lawrence gap yeah, yeah, yeah so you you left school you went all the way through school yeah so i, I finished high school um started at bcc I wanted to do mass comm, but I didn't get in that year. So I went into a um, fine arts program and I did a year of that. And I can't remember why I stopped it, but I, then I went into liberal arts, which was more social studies and history and that kind of thing. Because history is a, was a strong point of mine. And then um, one summer I took a job at A&B Music Supplies as kind of like a counter boy <laughs> down in... Um, I have uh, one of those jobs, by the way. Prince, Prince Alfred Henry Street. Yes. I believe Prince I worked with your dad, actually. Yes. I, I worked with your dad yes. and Socks. Mr. Welch. Correct. Well, both of them are Welch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so both lovely, lovely men. And um, I really enjoyed it. And being, being around uh, those kind of people and that kind of industry made me feel like I'd kind of found my tribe mm -hmm. at that time. And I really loved it. And so the owners had gotten some materials for uh, for a, a university that they were trying to kind of direct their son, who is my age, towards. But he really wasn't interested in it. You know, he was more interested in finance. And yeah, funnily yeah. enough, that's what she, what he's doing now. Yeah. And so one day he kind of gave me the, the, you know, there was no website for it. It was, you get a stack of documents and magazines and that kind of application <laughs> yeah. forms and that kind of stuff. And that's kind of how I got interested in recording engineering, but I was still, you know, gigging and playing guitar and singing all around the place. And so that's kind of how I fell into becoming a recording engineer because I took it home and showed my parents and they were like, ah, boy, you finally found it something you wanted to do as opposed to, you know, gigging about. They, they had yeah. lost all hope that I would have a proper career. <laughs> and this is probably the most, uh, you know, official thing that, yeah, that yeah. they would support me in right. rather than just being a, a, a musician. Cause you know, even now people say that being a musician is not a real career right. in, in, especially in Barbados, mm -hmm. you know, they, they see it as being a hobby. That was something that, I mean, I, I still hear musicians complaining about the, the industry here and that was very real back in, this is this is nineties. And the band scene was actually pretty good back then. You know, there were a lot of people playing music and there was a lot of live music that had Four played. I had. Um, Remember Desire. Desire, yeah, they had Desire, and they also um, Second Avenue was still mm -hmm. big back yeah. then. Yeah. And so you know that that's kind of where it went. But my parents were, I think, they were a little worried that that was the only thing I wanted to do. <laughs> and so you know, when I found found that option, you know, they they definitely supported me in that. So when you found the recording engineering part of it, did you stop the music altogether or what brought me to, what was you pushed to say, all right, let me put on this guitar and this mic and let me go into recording studio? It was, I think it was definitely being exposed to A&B Music Supplies because obviously they do live sound as well. And okay. so, you know, they would take me out on live sound um, shows and I worked with uh, Pedro from A&B, still yeah. working there. And um, Pedro Hunt. Correct. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I found it fascinating. And I was actually more interested in the live sound aspect than the recording aspect of it. Okay. Because I didn't really know about recording engineering. I it was more the live sound that I was kind of mm -hmm. keen on because I had to do my own sound as a, as a musician. And so um, 
at that time I I saw the opportunity that maybe I could become a live sound engineer and and mix bands and that kind of stuff. But then I went to the states and I it was both live sound and recording engineering, and I saw these massive twenty four track SSL and Neve. Uh, boards, boards yeah. and recording studios. I just fell in love with that. I was like, "Whoa!" Right. You know, that kind of blew my mind. And you know, they had they still had the twenty-four track tape machines, and Pro Tools was only now coming out. I think it was like version two at okay. the time, right. <laughs> showing yeah, yeah. my age. <laughs> and oh, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> lies, lies. <laughs> but yeah, so I really fell in love with the recording aspect of it. Um, and it was cool because you know it was natural active recording studio full sale, mm -hmm. so you could rent the studio and you could um, assist in tracking sessions and, and that kind okay. of thing. And it was very very hands on, mm -hmm. and I kind of decided that that was the direction I wanted to take. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of just um, you know choosing that path over over live. Got it. Is there anything about gigging that you miss today? I miss performing bad all the time. All the time. Right. You know, I don't miss the politics of being a musician and being in a band. Being in a band is like being married to five guys or five <laughs> people. And they all have their own egos and they all have their own agendas and they all have their own vision for what they want to do. And you kind of got to find a balance or else it's not going to work. Right, right. Um, and yeah, I mean, that that's definitely challenging. So we can't get our reunion then? Leave. Man, I would do a reunion, but not not permanently, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, everybody lives all over the place now. All right, yeah. so let me say if you get the timeline, you you went to school, BCC, then you got into A and B. Yeah, that was just like you know summer job, summer job kind of kind thing. Of thing. Like my day job, when, right? So you were still sales, gigging, and then you went into gigs, playing in the bands, and yeah. so on. Then you went into recording studio, yeah, and then you went from that to then owning your own studio, becoming a businessman you now mm. and a creative. Yeah. And then it wasn't about music anymore. You were now adding vigils now. Yeah. I mean, so, I was still doing, it was obviously sort of, uh, use a technical term, more of a crossfade <laughs> yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah. from audio into video. I was still yeah. doing that up until maybe about 12 years ago. I was still doing voiceovers and jingles and that okay. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I kind of really fell in love with the process of creating visual elements uh, and working with them. And, um, you know, it was, it was the whole process that I really loved, including the audio. So, you know, uh, basically if you have really good video and bad audio, it's going to be a bad product. Yeah. Um, whereas if you have decent video, that's not that great and great, great audio, audio, it can really make a huge difference. Um, and so, you know, I love the entire process and I would be involved in the entire process, including audio, sound design and video as well. And so, uh, you know, I just basically took whatever opportunity came my way and figured it out along the way. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how, and, and I know, yeah, knowing yeah, you, that's kind of, it's kind of what you got to do. And along that way that you speak of came OBX, Order Banks. The, yeah. Can you explain what that is for people who may not know? Um, Outer Banks is a Netflix original series that uh, is basically uh, sort of like an adventure romance type mm -hmm. uh, show. Right. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's filmed in the Carolinas and basically, uh, you know, it's done very well. You know, when I got hired for it, I didn't even know what it was, to be honest with you, because it's not really set. In your demographic for my demographic <laughs> <laughs> but um it's done very very well right. and um you know i i got a random call uh, a good friend of mine recommended it uh, big up gg and uh she recommended me for a location scout mm -hmm. um to basically help these guys you know find different locations and introduce them to people and that sort of thing and uh yeah so i did that job you know, they went back and, and, you know, took the photos that I had taken and, and that kind of thing. And then a couple weeks, maybe a month or two later, I get a call asking if I would be interested in being the fixer for it. And um, obviously I said, absolutely, you know, can't t turn something like that down. But I had never done anything really on that scale before. Right. And right. so, again, you, you just had kinda, any doubts at that part though? Like, um, can I really do this? 
Oh, yeah. Do I know what I'm doing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have those doubts every day. You kind of got to talk yourself out of it, you know? Right. Um, you know, that, that uh, something of that scale and obviously taking on that responsibility is huge because you're only as good as your last job. Right. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. If, you know, that I, I've had, um, I've had <laughs> them sound effects. <laughs> I've had uh, I've had jobs where you know I haven't been 100% happy with, mm -hmm. and it kind of plays on your mind a lot after that. They torture you. <laughs> oh yeah, you know things you could have done differently, or yeah. the things you could have said differently, or yeah. the the things, the ways you could have reacted to different situations or people differently. Um, you know, and I tend to be an overthinker, so that that sort of thing. Right. And I think that also helps me in the way that I conduct myself as well sort of making sure that you don't do the same things that you wish you hadn't done before. Right. So you would take note of the stuff that you regret. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. And then kind of. I actually take it a, a step further. So whenever I finish a job, I go to my client and I say, okay, let's have what I call a post-mortem. Right. Um, it's kind of a grim term, but it's the best way to do it, where you go back and you analyze the things that you've done and the way that you've managed the, the work and the job. And you know, ask them straight, look, I want you to be completely transparent. What could I have done differently? What, how, what could I have improved on? Mm -hmm. How would you rather me have dealt with certain situations that were difficult? And, you know, nine out of 10 times, they will give you very honest and sometimes brutal feedback. Right. And, you know, it, it, sometimes it's a, a blow to the ego and you mm -hmm. kind of you want to argue with them, but they're being honest, right? And that's right. what you ask for. Yeah. And I find that is extremely useful in in being able to adapt yourself uh, going forward. That's something that I, I put into practice every time I do a job. Okay. Because okay. it really helps, you know. That's good, man. So by the time you got to the OBX, what were some of the things that stuck with you? How Can you like kind of tell me like <laughs> one of the craziest days you had on set? With Outer Banks? Yes. And what day wasn't crazy? <laughs> so Outer Banks came at the end, came to me at the end of 2019, where, you know, the whole Wuhan virus was starting. Right, and, right. You know, there was whispers on social media that reached US and that kind of thing. And I got hired right before Christmas 2019. And so by New Year, I actually had a gig with a, with a famous DJ doing a live stream. <laughs> um, the Prime Minister shut down the island. That was New Year's. Eve. Right. And I had this big job pending. And it was basically locked down from December 31st going into 2020. So obviously, yeah, I was a bit concerned about that <laughs> because, you know, you couldn't really go anywhere. You, mm -hmm. you had to stay within your curtilage and that kind of thing. And so we were scheduled to start shooting, I think it was February or March of 2020. And whole world was starting to lock down. Travel was restricted, yada, yada, yada. And so I was obviously very lucky. Um, you know, shout out to Annette Nias, who was a film commissioner at the time. She helped me navigate that, um, going to the different departments. We had lots of conversations with the Ministry of Health. I mean, literally every single ministry I had to deal with, with pertaining to, to COVID and restrictions. Mm -hmm. Um, the attorney general's office, he was the one basically in charge of movement around the island. The Ministry of Health basically had to sign off on us being able to film or work at all. Wow. Um, so what I'm hearing, right, is not only you're now having the opportunity to work with one of the biggest production companies, but at the time, <laughs> at the most difficult time you could ever do it. Yeah. It was rough. It was rough. I ain't rather you than me. I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna lie. Lots of sleepless nights for right. sure. But you know, you kind of just gotta put your head down and, and push through. You gotta be tenacious and be able to to find a way or a path through. Because at the end of the day, the job gotta get done. You know, budgets are there and deadlines are in place, and you have to find a way. What worked in our favor is a Netflix. Um, B, it was a very successful first season um, that, uh, you know, did very well. And it was able, you were able to use the the weight of that to 
open a lot of doors and being able to have conversations to actually even consider that it could happen. And so, you know, I was able to, we had a lot of Zoom calls with government and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, uh, at the time, there was no tourism. Like, flights were shut down. There was, you know, nobody was traveling. And so at the time, um, the prime minister was talking about diversifying the economy away from tourism. And um, we had the, uh, what do you call the? Um, welcome stamp. We had the welcome stamp mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so that sort of played in our favor where we were like, look, this is a way to diversify, you know, this industry is massive. It's worth billions and billions of dollars, even trillions. You know, it would be great for Bar Barbados to have this uh, come down and, well, one, it's, you know, an hour long commercial each episode for Barbados. For Barbados yeah. Although the first season wasn't set in Barbados, it was being cheated for the Bahamas, mm -hmm. which was a whole other <laughs> kettle of fish. I mean, people were very upset when they saw Bridgetown and it was called Nassau Bahamas, mm -hmm. but. But any story, it was Barbados. No, but the set, but the set was Bahamas. It was, other way around. It was the other way around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, the narrative for season one is that they left the Carolinas and were seeking this, searching for this treasure mm -hmm. in the Bahamas. But when they went to the Bahamas, uh, you know, after they had written season two, a lot of the narrative and a lot of the locations that they had written into the script didn't really exist. Like there were a lot of scenes with sugar cane and, and that kind of thing. And Bahamas ain't got no cane, you just check up industry right. dried up in Bahamas ages ago. And so they sort of ruled out the Bahamas as a location and started searching the Caribbean for, um, for other locations. And okay. they came to Barbados and the directors and the writer, their, their twin brothers, uh, they fell in love with it, you know, and that was very, very good for us basically ticked a lot of boxes. They love Spitestown. They love the careenage. Um, they love a lot of the historical um, aesthetic that Barbados has. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they chose it. So, but yeah, the, the pandemic definitely threw a sort of spanner in the works and, and made things, it was a whole different level of fixing that I had to go through. Right, right. What are so many things that we can do here on the island to like have more opportunity or welcome more opportunities like that? Like more Netflix stuff or? Well, you know, we've taken a, a really good step towards that in having legislation in place for film com uh, concessions and um, sort of uh, rebates and that sort of thing. Where if, you know, you have a certain level of budget, you are applicable to, um, you know, duty-free concessions and, you know, um, immigration waivers for work permits and, tax rebates for, for certain things. And so that's really great. That, that happened this year. I have personally haven't worked with it because I've been working on some other things in different countries and that kind of thing. If a film or television production is looking to film in a different location, there is basically a database online that lists every single country that has a concession or a rebate. And if that country isn't on that database, you might as well not exist. Like, no. that's how the industry works. Okay. And that's how Atlanta was able to compete with Hollywood. That's how Toronto is able to compete with Vancouver and Montreal. They all compete with different levels of rebates and concessions and incentives. And the reality is, is that, you know, Barbados doesn't compete with the rest of the region for the film industry. It competes with the entire world. I mean, we're not the only tropical island. You know, there's, there's Thailand, there's the Seychelles, there's Mauritius, you know, there's, I mean, literally I just finished a job where they were looking, um, over in Turkey or, or the Seychelles and they, and as well as the Caribbean. And so they, we were lucky that they chose the Caribbean. Suffice to say that what we're, the, the direction we're heading in is good. Having, um, successful productions like, uh, Outer Banks, HBO succession, those sort of things are a great CV builder for the country. Obviously, you know, other producers talk, whereas the industry is big, it's very, very tight knit. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows everybody because no one production has the same people from one to the other. They all sort of cross pollinate with each other yeah. and word gets out and word of mouth in, in the industry is king. 
that's how I pretty much get all of my work. I mean, yeah, I have my website and my socials and that kind of thing, but they don't have the reach that your reputation does. And so, like I said, um, you know, your last job is, you're only as good as your last job. And so, you know, that applies to Barbados as well. I think it's important uh, not only to have those concessions, but training is extremely important. What I've observed is that a lot of people want to only be a cinematographer or only be a director mm -hmm. or only be a producer. And that leaves a hole for a lot of other different roles to be filled. And it's actually a, a really good opportunity for people in the industry. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we only have a couple of really good sound people for film and television in Barbados. And they get, you know, pickety litter, they get all the work. Right. Um, and that is, again, based on their reputation and their ability to maintain their standards. But that leaves an opportunity for a lot of other people to come in and work under them and work with them and train with them to be able to fill those roles. Do you think that the roles that are taken now, um, they're just more, they look more appealing or is it the way it's marketed and that the sound doesn't seem as, you know? 100%, <laughs> 100%. It's not as glamorous. Yeah. You know, everybody wants that title of director or producer or cinematographer yeah. under the belt. Um, you know, even me, like I, I was calling myself a producer way before I was an actual producer. Right. That's more of a fake it till you make it kind of thing. <laughs> right, and right. the fact is that you have to. Yeah. You have to be able to be bad at something and take the risk to be able to call yourself a title that you want to be right. before you actually develop yourself into that role. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that said, I mean, there's only like two really good key grips three really good key grips in Barbados. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can name them on, on one hand. Um, there are more people coming in that are filling that role, but I think a training program would be fantastic mm -hmm. um, where, you know, professionals from outside of Barbados come in and they train people and they do workshops and that kind of thing. And I've seen it happening since I left Barbados, which is fantastic. But I think in order to be able to support large scale productions like right now we could probably only support one or two major large scale productions mm -hmm. at a time in barbados right and that's because of the lack of of crew what i think happens though because we usually have to start as a one-man band you know correct so we start as director so we get into the camera and then audio and then lights grip and then all these say cascade mm -hmm. and then come all the way down so you yep. have to do all those jobs yep so i think is is one of these things where you still have to kind of dive into it and then see which role you feel comfortable in or you think you're really Absolutely. good at yeah and then there's some roles that you don't really want to do but you're forced to do it because it's <laughs> telling me because of the job or yeah. the budget or whatever yeah. it's just not enough to split yeah, I mean, the reality in, in Barbados and to a greater extent the Caribbean is that there is no real industry to speak of right. yet. Um, we have a lot of people doing amazing things. I'm not saying that there's not, but to have a sort of successful industry, you know, we grew up having, like you said, having to do everything and having to learn how to do everything, YouTube videos yep. and, you know, basically trial and error. There were projects that I, I'm not 100% proud of that I ain't going to mention. Um, you know, and that's how you learn. Because there's no real industry, mm -hmm. you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to have multiple skills in order to, to take different jobs. So yeah, I, I mean, I was, my training was sound and audio, but then I got into video and, you know, worked as a PA in a couple of productions and learned by doing um, and I, but I've done grip I've you know, I've done production management, I've right. done live sound, um, live streaming. I did a lot of live streaming for a while. And I, and like you said, I tried a lot of different things. I even went into web design for a hot minute and oh, <laughs> that's all like <laughs> on the left. Like <laughs> again, I got the opportunity and learned how to do it and did it. I, produced a couple big websites in Barbados and okay. found out I didn't like it. It was too tedious and yeah. it wasn't something that I was passionate about. So I, I, 
these, abandon that. The thing is about even creating your own business, um, you are forced into taking on all these roles yeah. when you first start, especially it's true. like, let's talk about it. You're creating your business. You may have to, you don't have any money to pay other people. So you have to build nope. your own website. You have to do your own invoicing. Correct. You got to learn accounts. <laughs> but that's how so, I learned, that's how I learned to develop websites because I built my own. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so I was then, like, well, I could do this for other people, you know. And then that's where distraction comes in. Yes. Because you're no longer just working on your business, but you're not working on other people's business as well. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> because you just learn how to do it. Yeah. So I think that is important to kind of like stay focused. Not that you don't want to be open and and do that but i think that the distraction may cost you a lot more than winning a job here and there for a couple of website designs i mean yeah. what's your opinion correct i think both of those scenarios are correct right. because had i not been open and had i not sort of been distracted by other things that i was interested in right i wouldn't be in a position i'm in no i right. would still be a recording engineer doing right. jingles and that kind of stuff okay. which is fine you know, a lot of people who started with me are still doing what they're doing and that's fantastic. And they're excelling. They have that kind of focus, but that's not who I am. <laughs> you know, I, I am always looking for the next opportunity and the next opportunity, not necessarily just in the job itself, but the next opportunity for me to learn and grow as a person and as, as a professional. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a fine line between keeping focused and keeping an eye out for opportunities to be able to to grow and diversify right right you know got it so they stay flexible and open the thing yeah yeah you know one of my favorite sayings is um luck is what happens when opportunity meets preparation correct correct and that's something that i definitely um live by um because you know having an opportunity is one thing but being able to take it is a, is a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. So for example, in 2019, I did a job for CPL um, where I was the chief uh, drone operator for the, for, the, for the match. And two months prior to that, I had applied to the CARICOM um, certification board to get my CARICOM certification <laughs> to basically be able to work throughout the Caribbean. Right. And that's something that I had in my mind's eye that I wanted to not only work in Barbados, but I wanted to work in the Caribbean yeah, spread out, yeah. and spread out and expand and that kind of thing and be able to move freely and work freely. And had I not done that prior and had the preparation to do that, I wouldn't have been able to take that CPL job in 2019 because, you know, I go into Jamaica or Grenada and they'd be like, what are you doing here? You coming to work now, nah, man, go home. <laughs> and so being, putting yourself in a position where you see the scope of opportunities that come to you and putting things in place to be able to take those opportunities. Um, you know, they may not present themselves right away, but down the line, you never know what's going to happen. So you're kind of building muscle or you're building like collateral, like, you know, or assets really. Yeah. And skills. Yeah. So that if the opportunity does come, you're already like, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. And then, you know, people call you lucky. Correct, correct. Yeah, that makes sense. So would you consider yourself a generalist or a specialist? I would have to consider myself a generalist. Right. Who wants to be a specialist? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who doesn't? You know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing because uh, there's a lot of memes uh, on the internet about the industry looking down on generalists mm -hmm. and having multiple roles and not being the key grip or not being the line producer. I am both a drone operator and a producer slash fixer. There's almost like three titles into what I do. Mm -hmm. And I haven't found, I'm 45 years old and I haven't found what I want to do as an adult yet. Right. You know, I, um, I'm always passionate about learning and taking new opportunities and different paths in which to grow. Like I, like you said, I, I started off as a musician, became a recording engineer. I was a radio announcer slash DJ for two years. I was MC for parties, um, band leader, you know, uh, wow. recording engineer. It's so many, I, I still do voiceovers, you know, cause right. you know, I still get the opportunity every now and again. I don't think I'll ever have one particular role that I think I would stick with just because 
I know myself and I know that I'm always sort of looking for opportunities to be able to do different things. Right. Like I, I went to Saudi Arabia for six months recently and I never in my wildest dreams would I thought I had been able to, to go and do that. And, do that. Yeah. and that was one of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had in terms of exposure to different cultures and different lifestyles and, and amazing people. And what were you doing there? What was your role? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, a producer. I was a senior okay. senior okay. producer over there. And they're basically, I don't know if you've heard of Neom, but um, they're building these massive smart cities in the middle of a desert in Western Saudi Arabia. Yes, I saw that. I was in Barbados, uh, basically location scouting for Outer Banks. And I get a email, I was at Hilton, and uh, they're like, hey, we're looking for producers over in Saudi Arabia. Let me know if you're interested. And this was a client that I had had in 2019 I'd done one or two jobs for, I think, Discovery TLC for them. And uh, it was just a general email to all of their producers because they have producers all around the world. And I responded just out of curiosity because I basically, you know, I, I don't turn down any opportunities without seriously considering them first. Although this one seemed really far-fetched. Uh, I was like, well, Saudi Arabia, you can't not ask a question. Like, <laughs> why would anybody want me to go to Saudi Arabia? Yeah, why me? Yeah. So I responded and we had a phone call and they, we talked about it. The money was real good. But the opportunity to go and see and live in a different culture was something I, I mean, at first I was like, nah, I just moved to Canada. I got all my my life up there. Now I'm trying to set up a new life in Canada. Um, you know, my partner is up there and that's not going to happen kind of thing. But then I spoke to my family who I, you know, I, I value their opinion very highly. And, you know, they were like, well, sounds like a really good opportunity. You know, why wouldn't you not take it? My, one of my brothers like, are your bags packed yet? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I gave them all the reasons, you know, just setting up a new life kind of thing. And then I spoke to my partner and she's like, are you mad? Look. Let me go. Let me go. <laughs> Seats are moving. <laughs> so I finished Outer Banks uh, in August, the end of August. And two weeks later, I was on a plane to Saudi Arabia. Wow. Yeah. So wow. I basically had to go back to Canada, pack up my life, get all my visa and everything sorted, get my work permit approved for, to work in Saudi Arabia. And then it was 57 hours flying from Canada to Saudi that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, from the end of 2019, you were now gearing up to do a live stream for a DJ. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the place gets shut down. Yep. And then you on a Netflix production, then you're in Saudi Arabia. I moved, which, I moved to Canada. Canada between, yeah, yeah. In between there. <laughs> yeah. Like, man, what? <laughs> There's no stability with you, though. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been a wild ride the past four years or so, right. for sure. I was going to ask you about um, your partner, but she seems to be someone that is very supportive of you and I think that is important. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm very lucky in the sense that she actually worked in the industry for 16 years. She worked okay, for a production so company. And so she understood how things mm -hmm. went and I'm definitely very fortunate for that. Yeah. And yeah. very grateful. So big up to her, man. Correct. <laughs> big up, Jamie. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she was like, yeah, you're kind of crazy for not even considering taking this job. Yeah. And yeah, so six months there, you know, met my first camel. It yeah. was just wild. What was your biggest culture shock? Um, the biggest culture shock for me going to Saudi was being wrong about all of my preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. Basically, the the narrative that the western media paints about the middle east and saudi arabia in general it's outdated mm -hmm. it may have been somewhat accurate at the time but there's been a huge transformation within society in, in that country and they're actively making steps towards becoming more liberal and becoming more more of a free country and that was my biggest shock like i, I expected what everyone sort of thinks mm. would happen in Saudi Arabia. And yeah, it was very, very wrong. It was it was great, but it was very, very mind blowing. The scale at which they're operating is something that I don't think many people could really picture 
you know, I was down in the foundation of the line, which is this 178 kilometer long mega city that's taller than the Eiffel Tower. And the only way we could actually measure uh, the development, and I was in charge of a lot of the drone operations within that area because of my experience with drones. The only way they can measure the development of the construction is with drones because of the actual scale. You had to fly to be able to see how, wow. and it's mind boggling. And you know how you take a drone shot of, of people and they kind of look like ants? Yeah. Well, it was like that, except the ants were these massive diggers and machinery. <laughs> if you, so that, if that pitch, that, that gives you an idea of the scale. Wow. And I'm talking about not hundreds, I'm talking about thousands of trucks and diggers and excavators and bulldozers. And it, it was just mind boggling. I mean, you can see it online. It's just, it's just crazy. Was it, was it name? Was it a project? Neom. Neom. Uh, okay. And within Neom, there's the line Trojana, Oxagon, um, and a couple others now, that are now coming up as well. And um, there's Sindala, which is a uber luxurious, uber luxurious um, private island with a marina and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty wild. Yeah, man. But Phil, I mean, like a lot of what you're doing goes against a lot of the things we've been taught. And then when I, why, why I say that is because you usually get, okay, subtle focus on this and just build on that, you know, like be a pro and don't be distracted. Mm -hmm. But for you, you're almost like you created this, this army knife, you know, you just <laughs> right, fixer, producer, voiceover, you need a website too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm undiagnosed ADHD. <laughs> you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a disadvantage. I think it's a, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have to be able to play to those strengths. A lot of kids nowadays, they have ADHD and they have this sort of attention deficit and it's actually not a deficit. It's the ability to focus on multiple things at the same time. But if you're stuck in a classroom being told to memorize and regurgitate something, over and over again for eight hours a day, and you don't have the propensity to be able to focus on that. You need to have um, engagement, and you need to be able to to work with your hands, and you need to be able to to learn in different ways. Obviously, that's not going to work for you. Right. And so, I was very very lucky, as I mentioned. Yeah, I went through the traditional school system, but when I came out of it, I was encouraged as a as a youngster to follow my passion, and just just follow your heart. Being able to do that and being able to to follow that sort of that compass has given me the opportunity to to take on multiple opportunities and, and different opportunities. I'm very very grateful for that kind of support. Okay. To be able to do what your heart tells you and do what your 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 mind wants to do, it gives you the flexibility to to say, okay, this is a kind of a crazy harebrained opportunity. But what's actually stopping me from doing it? Mm -hmm. And if you sit down and go, okay, pros and cons. Yeah, there's there's no real significant cons other than your mind telling you. Programming. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Your mind telling you, but what about this? What about that? What about the other? And if you sit down and, and sort of go, well, why shouldn't I do this? Mm -hmm. You know, within the realms of morality and legality. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, a lot of times it's just your own self-doubt and right. your own uh, self-limiting beliefs that stop you from doing something. Right. And I firmly believe in the fact that you create your own reality. You know? <laughs> yeah, I like that. That was deep. People call it a deficit. But is it that the school system is the deficit? <laughs> 100%. 100%. You know, I think, I think the Montessori system... Um, in education has part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Where they play toward the strengths of a child mm -hmm. and they foster, you know, the, the child, child's ability to grow in a certain direction. So if the child is artistic, they'll, they'll push them in that direction. If the child is uh, sort of more technical, they'll lead them towards the sciences. Mm -hmm. But I think that having the mindset that every single child and every single person is different and has their own special abilities 
is really, really important to be able to understand the fact that we can't all fit into the same mold. Yeah. Each person is very, very different and you can't expect each person to react to the same stimulus, which is edu traditional education system and expect the same outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not robots, we're not ants, but that's kind of how the education system is tailored and being able to to learn how to think and how to analyze and how to adapt is I think more important than being able to regurgitate facts. Yeah, yeah. I believe that 100%. Overall. And um, there is a meme and a saying out there that had this teacher teaching this class and it was a class with the different animals in the animal kingdom. So it was the elephant, the monkey, mm -hmm. and the fish, and the example was to climb the tree. Mm -hmm. So who you think can excel? And who you think and feel exactly does that mean that one is inferior than the other yeah you know? but tell that monkey to go and swim <laughs> exactly I mean, some monkeys do but <laughs> you know but so, you, yeah you, you get it right absolutely and i think a, lo a lot is happening in our society um and it plays a role on our mental health as well is that we are often misplaced mm -hmm. meaning that we are forced into a work system or a job <laughs> that we don't belong to so you understand so that's like okay let's give the fish a job to climb this tree what's going to happen you know correct he <laughs> so we, <that> up. <laughs> exactly so we're all we're all misplaced and i think that um the educational system have to focus on yes you focus on your strengths but then like you got to be a little bit more open-minded and not just think about the intellect part and you know there's the arts and the create like just like you yeah you know, let's say you came up and do you ever thought you'd be doing what you're doing now when you were, when you just came out of BCC? Not in a million years. <laughs> nope, never. Is there anything that you think you would have done differently if you had seen this route in your past? Nah, I can't really say I would do anything differently because you are the sum of your experiences and the sum of your reactions. And basically... Uh, your path molds who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And once you're able to be self-aware enough to look back and say, well, yes, I could have handled this differently or yes, I could have reacted differently. Um, but the fact is, is that it is what it is. It's gone. You can't change that. Mm -hmm. You can only look forward and adjust yourself accordingly. You can't live in the past. And that's something that I keep having to remind myself over and over again. But you know, I, I definitely made mistakes, but those mistakes made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. And my ability to adjust myself looking back has also made me who I am, if that makes any sense. You got it, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if I had done anything differently, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Right, right. You know? <laughs> At age 45, and you said it, I didn't say, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess it's yep. all right, you know. Um, and you said you're not sure on where you 100% fitting. Is that correct? Is, is Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. So you're still in the <clears throat> explorer curious stage? Always. I don't think I'll ever not be curious about where I will be the next step or the next year. Because mm -hmm. uh, life has shown me that it could be anywhere. I could be on the other side of the planet in a month. Right. Sounds great to me. Let's go. To some people, that's scary. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say that it wasn't scary for me to jump on a plane and go to Saudi Arabia. If it was supposed to be a year. I ended my contract because certain things didn't work out for me. And I was able to look at that and say, okay, this isn't working for me the way I had hoped it worked out. But I can always learn from it. I terminated my contract after six months because I knew within myself it wasn't for me. I loved being there, but the situation just didn't work out for me. Okay. Was it that you just needed a, a break or? Burnout was something that definitely uh, happens a lot in my industry. Right. And so I think that having done Outer Bank season two, move to Canada, come back to Barbados for season three twice, and then moved to Saudi Arabia, was supposed to be for a year. I overcommitted to myself, to my health, 
to my mental health, to my physical health, just because I wanted to push myself to the limit. And I knew it was going to be difficult, but I just didn't realize how difficult it was going to be. And being able to take a step back and say, all right, you know what? Maybe I've overcommitted to myself at this point. I need to be able to take next steps that are right for myself, for my mental health, for my physical health, because at the end of the day, you know, if your mental health isn't in a good place, uh, there's pretty much nothing else. Your your physical health yeah. fails. Correct. And I didn't give myself the opportunity to take a rest, which is very important. Like I just finished a, a 10 week um, reality series in Grenada. And I learned from that. I learned from the, the Saudi Arabia experience that I need to be able to take the time to be able to, to rest and reset both physically and mentally. So I sort of planned after I finished the show, take a week off, stay in Grenada, I slept for four days straight. No mm -hmm. light. Four days. Four days straight. Mm -hmm. I ate, showered, and slept. Mm -hmm. That was it. And I feel great. And it was 10 weeks straight, 12 hours a day, six days a week for 10 weeks. Right. And it was rough. I mean, yeah. How do you actually tell the difference between when you're supposed to be pushing yourself and when you're supposed to rest and reset? It's difficult because you want to be able to perform to your best. Being able to tell the difference between pushing yourself to the limit, which is something that all of us have to do at some point, whether it's, you know, a school project or, you know, work schedule leading up to Christmas is brutal, that kind of thing. You know that, okay, I have a quarter tank left. Let me just push to that point. But when you reach the point of burnout, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody's human. Everybody has their own physical and, and personal limits. You need to know within yourself what those limits are. Mm -hmm. And you only learn by crossing those limits. Right. I mean, at any day, you have to learn how to know yourself both mentally and physically. Right. And be able to check in and check that yeah. gas meter yeah. Yeah. and see, well, hey, you know what? I kind of get in there and... Um, so you got to do a bit of start taking. And yeah. Be aware. Introspection is really, really important. So one of the things I do when I wake up every morning is I have a moment of gratitude, which is very, very important. Being grateful for waking up, feeling good. You're in a good place. You're not hungry. You know, you have a great career. You have people that love you, that kind of stuff. At that point, I then say, well, how do you feel today? Self-talk is really important. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel a certain way, you know, I try to meditate and I try to say, okay, why do I feel this certain way? Why do I have these thoughts? Why do I have, I mean, yeah, I may wake up with say aches and pains, no, you know, I'm 45 and that <laughs> kind of thing, but that's a different story. But being able to say, okay, why are you feeling miserable today? What's, what's getting at you? What, why do you feel upset? Um, and being able to, to talk to yourself and being able to, to analyze where you're at as a person really, really helps. You know, you, you have a, a mental health platform, which I think is amazing. Yeah. And I think it is something that is sorely, sorely needed in Barbados, in the world, but in Barbados as well. I think there's a stigma, uh, a very strong stigma against mental health in Barbados. In the Caribbean. In the Caribbean in general. And for men. And for men in general. So it's a trifecta. Um, and it is something that is seldom talked about. You know, I've had my struggles with mental health for sure. You know, I, I had a very uh, difficult experience with a home invasion uh, a number of years ago. And- um, This and is it, Barbados? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I nearly lost my life. You know, I, my, I was actually visiting my, um, my parents and the home invasion happened to happen at that time, 4.30 in the afternoon. 4.30? Uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, broad daylight. You know, we were very, very lucky in that I was there to help my stepfather defend against the invader, um, but we got chopped up. And yeah, I nearly lost my thumb. It, it was it was rough. I, some Collins chops on my, my shoulder and thing. And um, that was a very difficult time in my life. So for like two years, I 
suffered from what I now know. I didn't know at the time. Now, this was maybe 15, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, I had PTSD. All right. And, um, you know, the classic signs, you know, poor sleep, um, hypervigilance, um, extreme reactions to things, nightmares, that kind of stuff. And it was like two years of very, very difficult period of my life. And unfortunately, you know, for those two years, I didn't get the help I needed. And it was extremely difficult. Um, at that time, that sort of experience led me to stop drinking completely. And it's been no... So you used to drink a lot around that period? Yeah. I mean, Barbados, let's face it, Barbados is a, a drinking culture. I mean, we grew up from young, young, you know, it's, it's exalted, it's, yeah. it's celebrated. Yeah. You know, rum is uh, our thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's definitely ingrained in, in who we are as a people. And it's widely accepted. We are the inventors of rum. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And so, you know, you, you, you drink to celebrate and you drink to commiserate. And, and self-medicate. And self-medicate. Correct. And so that was definitely a huge part of my life. Everything I did involved alcohol. You know, I'm not saying that it was bad. It was just part of my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, I owned a bar as well as another hat I had oh, for, wow. for a while. <laughs> Um, I co-owned a bar rather. And, um, you know, can I was- Can you name it or can, you can't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um, co-own Mojo down on your uh, South Coast. Everybody know Mojo. Everybody know Mojo's. <laughs> and that was a bar that I grew up hanging out in, right. in my in my 20s, you know, being in a band and being an MC and being, everything I did was, was involved in drinking. And then when that traumatic experience happened to me, you know, I got stitched up and- you know, I couldn't bartend anymore, but I went straight to Mojo and I, that was it. And it'll get chopped up. Give me some drinks. Wow. And um, that, I think, sort of took me into a bit of a spiral. And I was drinking more and, you know, the nightmares, I would have to drink to fall asleep so that I wouldn't have the nightmares mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And it sort of took me in a, in a, in a direction that wasn't that great. And, you know, one night I got so messed up that I basically went out and, um, you know, did a few things I wasn't very proud of. And I came home, got into a fight with my girlfriend who was overseas, a long distance relationship. You fought overseas. Yeah, it was a phone call. <laughs> like three, three in the morning, I went back out, mm -hmm. did more foolishness. And I don't remember it. Yeah. You were, it was black, complete blackout. You're a blackout. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember any of that. And that was pretty much the end of my relationship. I, it was a very important relationship to me at the time, and that sort of was the rock bottom for me, where I was like, you know what, this ain't working for me no more. What you were doing professionally at this point? At that time, I was, I believe. I was still a musician. I had shareholdings in Mojo, in the bar, in the bar mm -hmm. and I had my recording studio. Right. So you were balancing all of that while dealing with your trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And alcohol. Yeah. And so um, I realized that things were starting to go wrong, that my business wasn't starting to do that well. And I was burning the candle at both ends professionally anyway, having to juggle being in a bar scenario and, you know, running a recording studio. So I stepped away from the band and I stepped away and became a silent partner in the bar. And I decided to focus on my career at the time. Yeah, it was, uh, it was difficult, you know, but I sought help. And uh, I think it's been 13 years I haven't had a drink. Congratulations. And um, yeah, you know, it was the best thing I ever did for myself. And I, you know, I, I Decided, you know, let me start with, with one month and it turned into two months and I started to become more productive. I started to feel better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, everything started to click, mm -hmm. you know, things started to work. And I was like, man, I done with that. I got a good idea. That's good. Uh, um, I'm just curious, to, did you do make all those changes 
in one go or was it like a one by one thing like when you you stepped away nah. from it was it was bit by bit, bit by i started bit. eliminating things that weren't working for me okay so for example the bar um life and the studio you know i was working the bar at night and then having to wake up early to do recording sessions and feeling groggy and not feeling great and obviously when you're working in a bar you're drinking drinks and with your friends and and that kind of thing so i stepped away from that and it definitely wasn't a uh an immediate decision to sort of clean up my life i just start started i stopped doing things that weren't working for me yeah and you saw the benefits so there oh yeah. yeah 100 my life has changed completely and the thing is is that you know earlier you mentioned you know is there anything that you would have done differently in your life to basically maybe change your path if i hadn't had gone to visit my parents that day god knows what would have happened you know they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger i didn't die that day but a part of me died because had i not gone through that traumatic experience i wouldn't have spiraled and gotten to the point where i needed to make significant changes so in a way in a very strange roundabout way destiny you know made me be sort of grateful for that experience because it took something very traumatizing to sort of make me get to the point where i'm like you know what this lifestyle ain't working for me no more wow and perspective yeah cuz i i mean if that hadn't happened i would probably be still in the bar business i would probably be still out you know playing gigs and doing the same thing the reason why it's a perspective because you could have gone the other way too as well you could have gone through that experience and got better mhm mm and sunk deeper yes yeah it's But, true at the end of the day right i mean you only have yourself to be accountable for you can try to blame other people for situations that you are in and yeah it could have been like man this paro man chopped me up and that kind of thing it and, was a paro yeah okay yeah he was a, a drug addict um and uh he got caught and got thrown in a jail for seven years even though i mean i thought it should have been longer because he tried to essentially kill my family yeah, yeah. um attempted murder <laughs> yeah It's... yeah um but like i said the way that you react to situations that is solely beholden unto yourself and for me i i mean obviously i'm not perfect and i still you know growth is not a straight line there's ebbs and flows and there's peaks and there's valleys i mean I'm sure you would know yes for sure yeah. um but being able to like i said self assess and see where you go wrong day by day how you react to certain situations is is i think a vital part of being able to grow you know a shark can stay this big in an aquarium that's only this big yeah but once you put it in the ocean change the environment grow bigger yeah 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 so do you think you you are healed I wouldn't say that I am 100% healed. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh healing again is not a straight line. It um it ebbs and flows and it it depends on your situation, it depends on how you take care of your health. There are definitely good days and bad days. Like there's still some triggers every now and again when I get stressed with work. Certain things come into play where my body it's because your experiences um are retained within your body your body reacts to certain experiences um so for example um our housekeeper when that thing happened screamed really really loud and for a number of years even after i stopped drinking and and sometimes more recently if i hear a, a shrill scream it, it triggers that, that triggers react that. It triggers that feeling okay but you just have to be able to to know that that's what 
sort of triggers you. Okay. So you had someone that was professional that helped you through that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen, um, there's this huge stigma against people seeing therapists and I don't understand why. Because, and I keep telling people, man, like when, when I suggest a therapist to somebody, you know, they go, man, I don't need a therapist, you know, I, I good, I, I, I good for myself, you know, I, I could take care of myself. And mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that before modern society formed the way it is now, when we used to move in tribes and packs of people, every iteration of one of those tribes had a shaman, mm -hmm. a healer, mm -hmm. a spiritual worker, mm -hmm. every single one. Some way, shape, or form, that person was there to help people who are troubled in society. You know, those people today are now therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, yeah. counselors. Yeah. Those Same are our thing, but those are our shamans because because of the education system, they have those titles. Yeah, but those are really who they are. Whether that within a spiritual community, whether that's your pastor or you know your whoever that is. We have those people in society now, but there's a stigma because in society, if you go and seek help because of your mental health, you're seen as weak. Weak, yeah. yeah. And you're seen as somebody that that you know is there's a you're a pariah in society. And you know, if you break your leg, you go go to the doctor to get it fixed. Yeah. So if you have something wrong with your mind, mind. Mm -hmm. why is it a problem that I need to go and seek help yeah. to get that fixed? And it's like a mental block in society. I think it's a lot better now. I think, yeah, it's changing. And I think the younger generations are a lot more open about about being able to seek help. But um, I think a lot of the older generations, uh, generations before ours, and even our generation, find it difficult to admit that I need to go and talk to somebody. Yeah, you know, and no man stands alone. That's true. That's true. I, I thank you for, for sharing that. And um, the reason why I was asking about if you were healed, because I'm just curious to see if it's something where you have to like revisit from time to time. As you said, healing is not a straight line. Yeah. So it's something that you have to do con constantly, consistently. Yep. Right? And then, because um, the work that you do is intense. Yes. It's long hours. Yep. There's really not a lot of sleep involved. You know, so. <laughs> my eye just twitched. You mentioned sleep, <laughs> and it's changing. It, it often puts you in a different time zone or a different climate. It's constantly changing. There's yeah. no real stability. No, no, there isn't. <laughs> and you know, a lot of a lot of people might argue that it's not necessarily the ideal situation for somebody that has experienced traumatic experiences or or has had to undergo that kind of of help mm -hmm. before but i love what i do you know i've always said i love my job and if that's what it takes for me to follow my passion you know a lot of times it does put undue stress on me but at the same time it's a path that i've chosen willingly and it's a decision i've made i could get a nine to five job if i wanted to right but that's not something that really, you know, fills me with joy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have learned through trial and error that a lot of times when, when you finish a big project like this and like, there's, there's a known crash after a big project. Like it's a, it's a, it's a known thing. It's an accepted. So even crash. before you take a job, you know, well, I can take this job and I'm going to crash really hard after. <laughs> yeah. You need to be able to plan for it. You need to be able to, so to plan predict. And I only learned that after maybe the first two or three big projects that I did. It's like when you stop, when you're going 12 to 15, 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week for, you know, 10 weeks at a time. And then you stop doing that. Your brain is in constant motion and your body is in constant motion. Like your steps is be cranked. Mm -hmm. You know, you're standing time, you know, my watch is telling me, look, you need to sit down. When you stop that project, your hormones become imbalanced. You basically, that adrenaline and that yeah. dopamine mm -hmm. is basically shut off. And so your brain kind of goes into like, it's like pulling a, a, a brake on a freight train. 
wow. everything stops and everything sort of becomes kind of unbalanced. So you need to be able to to plan for that. And the first couple of times it was like, whoa, like, shh. So how do you plan it was intense. for that? <laughs> well, you just got to, first of all, you got to expect it. I mean, that's just, just something that happens. But I think this past job that I just did in Grenada was a good example is that I didn't take any other jobs right away. I gave time to myself to heal. I accepted the fact that if I do crash, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. You know, beat yourself up with a feather is, okay. is a saying that I, I use a lot. I got it, got it. You know, it's Not something. Much harm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, you know, I, I got an Airbnb in Grenada. Mm -hmm. I didn't make any plans. I set myself aside a week to just rest. Whether whether that is, you know, going to the beach or, you know, playing video games or watching a Netflix show or however you take to, to soothe yourself in a in a healing way. Mm -hmm. um, so you could work hard, but plan to play hard. Yeah, you got to relax hard, man. Yeah, You got to be able to chill. And so I think that was one of the, um, you know, knock on wood, it's you now three weeks after the, the shoot that I just finished. And I was able to ease myself out of it without a hard crash. Mm -hmm. But I did sleep for four days straight. And that's, I just, if that's what my body needed, that's what I needed. If it yeah. was going to be a week, I would have slept a week. Yeah. But yeah. after four days, you know, I took my vitamins and drank lots of water and ate good food and, you know, yeah. came out of it relatively unscathed compared to yeah. previous yeah. ones. And that's, you know, something that I've learned just by the hard way. <laughs> and, and we also have to say that this is not for everyone. Yes. Yeah. This, this this is um, depending on your circumstances because, you know, resting hard, <laughs> you're, you have to have a family that understands that. Because yeah. if you come off of a job and you are away from your family for 10 weeks, and then as soon as you come back, your family going to want to spend time with you. But then if you want to sleep for four days, they have to understand. They have to be in a position to understand that. So then Correct. communication then would be key. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's because, I mean, I, I did that on purpose. I didn't fly back to Canada right away because... Right. So it was intentional. It was intentional mm -hmm. because I knew myself from past experiences that uh, I can be difficult after I, you know, I become like a cranky toddler, you know, no sleep you know, stress for 10 weeks at a time, you know, something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And if you put yourself in a situation where you're being asked of things that you're not ready or willing to give, that's a recipe for disaster. So I made sure to put a buffer in there in my trip or right. after my job to be able to say, all right, I need this for myself in order for me to be able to serve the people that I serve within my life. Mm -hmm in a healthy and meaningful way. And I think that it is very important to know yourself to the point where you know that your weaknesses and know when, you know, you need to take the time to take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I just want to end um, with one gem that you picked up along the way that you would keep reminding yourself. Is there is there one gem that you have learned throughout all of this, all these years, this time, all the different hats you wore, roles you play? What is one go-to for you? I think my one go-to for everything in life is gratitude. You have to be grateful for what you get and what uh, what life brings to you, whether it's good or bad. Because if it's good, then great, be grateful for it. If it's bad, then you learn from it and being able to adapt yourself from those negative experiences, that's really the only way you're gonna to learn and grow, right. is being able to be grateful for those experiences along the way. It prevents bitterness, it prevents uh, rumination, and gratitude is key. Got it. Whether it's good or bad. Got it. All right, Phil, this has been very insightful, and I thank you for coming through. Cheers. James from Friends is a wrap. <laughs> thanks, bro. And thanks for the coffee. Yeah, man. <laughs>